Hello and welcome to uh, Medical Monday right here on uh, E-Radio on uh, this Valentine's Day. It's uh, a very good morning to you, Dr. Dylan Joseph. <laughs> good good morning, Jan. Good morning. Uh, and uh, I won't say happy Valentine's Day to you. But, I was uh, wondering. To, <laughs> to, to the listeners out there, yeah, I hope it's a, it's, a, it's a good Valentine's Monday. It's a pity it's not on the Sunday, but what can we do? Yes, of course, yes. But at least it's a romantic start to uh, the new week, eh? That's it, absolutely. <laughs> so, so today, talking about uh, lens technology, very, very interesting uh, topic. I think let's go way back and talk, about, uh, talk a bit about the uh, history of uh, lenses and how did they eventually come about uh, being used in uh, the human eye, Dr. Joseph? So in uh, World War II, the pilots flew planes where the um, windshields were made out of PMMA or polymethyl methacrylate. And uh, every now and again, a bullet would go through that and and fracture the windshield and a piece of this PMMA uh, would end up in the pilot's eye. And uh, they found that if it wasn't a really bad injury, that uh, this piece of plastic or a PMMA would stay in the eye and it was inert, meaning it didn't cause an inflammatory reaction, it didn't cause an infective reaction. And it's a clear piece of uh, plastic. So they then thought, well, if this can stay in the eye and not cause any adverse reactions, why don't we consider making lenses out of it so that when people develop cataracts, we can replace that human lens, which is now cloudy, with this clear uh, substance made out of uh, PMMA. And uh, that is how the um, intraocular lens was born back in uh, World War II. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't even know it went back uh, that far. Interesting yep, story. Absolutely. And uh, let's talk about the first person to implant a lens into the eye. So the, the technology, although it was thought of in, in World War II, the first chap that actually uh, was brave enough to um, develop, design, and implant a lens was a chap called Sir Harold Ridley. And he did this at the uh, St. Thomas Hospital in London, and pretty much to the date, on the 8th of February, actually, it was uh, 1950. So 72 years ago, he implanted wow. the first intraocular lens in the human eye. So it's amazing to think that, you know, 72 years ago, uh, that when, was when the, the, the first trials were done on humans. And since then, we're now standing at lens counts um, and different uh, technologies, different substances of, um, you know, over 350, if not more. Wow, it's actually a nice uh, uh, history lesson that we're getting from you uh, this morning, mm -hmm. Dr. Joseph. <laughs> uh, the next question is, um, how did um, lenses evolve over the last 50 years? The, the basic uh, lens, as I said, was PMMA. And interestingly now, 72 years later, we still use those for what we call extracapsular cataract surgery. So typically in patients that have a very white, mature cataract. So it's those people that are brought in basically with walking canes or they need assistance. They can't see it. Their, their, their vision is literally light perception, which means they can only see light or hand movements. Um, those cataracts are so dense. So we can't use modern day ultrasound technology to break those lenses up. So we actually make a, but we take that whole lens out as one big piece. And then we replace that um, very commonly used product and still provide excellent vision in, um, in this sort of scenario. But there are other materials that lenses are made of today, the one being silicone. Silicone usually has very good biocompatibility, which means that it sits well in the eye. However, in patients with, um, for example, retinal detachments and who require silicone oil, the problem was these silicone lenses, when they came into contact with the silicone oil, they would opacify, which means they went opaque, and then you'd end up needing to remove these lenses. They... Um, I'm sure we, we've talked about probably on previous episodes what's called an after cataract. Now, everyone after cataract surgery will eventually develop an after cataract. It's not the cataract regrowing or coming back. Mm. It's the fact that that tiny thin membrane, the bag that we put that new lens into, that over time becomes opaque, usually anything between six, and, six months and six years after surgery. And um, the rates of that becoming opaque are slightly higher with silicone lenses as well. So, People thought, well, this is not really the ideal substance. What else can we look at? And uh, so acrylic uh, then came about. And, and there's two types of acrylic substances, hydrophobic, which means it repels water, and hydrophilic. 
um, which means it attracts water. Um, and uh, both of these do really, really well in the human eye. And the lower rates of opacification of the of that capsular bag, so we, we only have to do something about clearing that capsular bag up later. Uh, they sit well in the eye. They've got very good optics. And and today, the majority of lenses that we implant are actually the, um, the hydrophobic acrylics. Um, yeah, those come in an array of different technologies, which we'll get into a bit later. Yeah, so so basically, if you look at the the the, the human optics of, of the eye, it, it's a, it's a little bit te- technical, but the cornea or the front, the clear dome of the eye on the outside of the eye, the way that that bends light rays is actually designed in in a way that the light rays that go through it fall short of the back of the eye. So the, so the peripheral rays are actually bent too quickly. So all the light rays don't fall on exactly the same spot at the back of the eye. But interestingly, the human lens, which is in, inside the eye, compensates for this. And um, so when we talk in cl- technical terms, we call this spherical aberration. So the cornea or the front of the eye has slightly positive spherical aberration and the lens inside the eye has slightly negative spherical aberration. So as we get older though, this changes in the lens. And so when intraocular lenses were designed, Firstly, it was just this piece of acrylic or PMMA that was put in. They didn't think about the aberration that it was going to cause, the optical effect it was going to cause, but now that's all changed. So we've designed lenses today that can offset the way that the cornea bends the light rays so that when the light rays travel through the cornea, through the lens, they are optimized to fall on exactly one point at the back of the eye, which makes your uh, a vision during a daylight conditions, nighttime conditions, as optimal as possible. So it reduces glare, it reduces halos, um, it reduces something called chromatic aberration, which is splitting light up into different colors. So your, your contrast sensitivity is better, your appreciation of colors is better after cataract surgery um, or lens replacement surgery. So the technologies have, uh, have evolved drastically. Dr. Joseph, uh, let's uh, move on to uh, the next question. And uh, that would be, what are your different lens options available if I should have a, a lens replacement? The basic um, intraocular lens is designed to correct one distance, right? So um, the, the optics are what we call aspheric. So the design is, is optimized for um, really good focus at one specific distance. But, you know, we, we go into... And what I do a lot of is premium lens surgery. So toric lenses, which uh, we've talked about uh, before, uh, correct astigmatism. So astigmatism is the shape of the cornea is not shaped like a, a soccer ball. It's more like a rugby ball. And that causes distortion of light rays, which makes uh, blurred vision, especially at night. So we can use these toric lenses to offset that rugby ball shape, shape on the front of the, the eye to make your quality of vision as crisp and as clear as possible. Um, those toric lenses come in uh, lenses that correct just for one distance, or they come in different technologies uh, that correct a number of uh, uh, distances. So they come in trifocal technology as well, and trifocal works on what's called a diffractive principle. So it's got these, these uh, steps on the front of the lens which split light for us. And those, uh, that light, as it's split, helps us focus for 40 centimeters for reading, for 60 centimeters or 70 centimeters, depending on the different lens technology, and then uh, three meters to infinity as well. So broadening your range of spectacle independence, if not allowing you complete spectacle independence. And those are trifocals. We've got really new, exciting refractive lenses that we're busy trialing in the clinic now as well. And a refractive lens means the upper portion is set for distance and the lower portion is set for reading or set for computer. So irrespective of which technology you're using, we've got to make sure that we understand our patient's visual needs. How much time are they spending reading on a computer, on an iPad, on a phone, or on a desktop? What lighting conditions? You know, are they doing a lot of nighttime driving. These are all factors that are really critical in making a decision um, when correcting their vision across the various ranges. Those are the lenses that I use probably 70 to 80% of the time between trifocals and the refractive lenses. We can include the astigmatism correction as well. So we're really trying to push the the limits of of broadening your your range of vision and and bringing the most amount of spectacle independence for you. 
Yeah, at the end of the day, they all have their uh, their side effects, and we talk about them. So, some of them is uh, the, the side effects are that you can't read as well in low lighting, or that you may get glare or halos around lights um, at night. And and as long as the the patient knows that those are the side effect profiles of the various lens technologies, it's it's far easier to adapt to. The brain blends into it over time and tends to suppress those uh, those images, and it really doesn't bother people in most cases if you are warning them about it. And so, uh, yeah, an, an amazing uh, lens technologies. Um, with regards vision correction and, and super exciting. We're doing a, a, a second uh, clinical trial now as well on another uh, what we call diffractive lens technology, which is supposed to improve your night vision, supposed to improve your reading under low lighting conditions. So, you know, the boundaries are being pushed the whole time. I don't think anything is ever at this stage going to replace your normal lens that you had when you were mm. 20. Uh, but we're, uh, we're getting closer and closer to that point. And 99% of patients that have lens replacement surgery now are, are really satisfied with their functional range of vision. Dr. Joseph, then, of course, uh, the question uh, in terms of cost, what are we looking at? And the big question, will my medical aid cover it? Once again, like last week's discussion, it depends on your medical aid plan, your scheme of benefits. But um, premium lenses are seen as a cosmetic procedure. So a medical aid will pay up to a certain a ceiling, a certain amount. Mm. Um, but it's important to let the patient know then the balance is, is due. Um, and uh, if you look at it in terms of the costs of ongoing very focal spectacle correction or contact lenses uh, for the rest of your life, um, at, at the end of the day, it actually works out as a cost saver, mm-hmm. um, even though there, there may be a co-payment due on the, uh, on the lens technology. So that's, uh, yeah, a very, very good question. Um, but uh, we make sure that everyone in the clinic uh, knows what they're in for in terms of costs if they are choosing a premium lens technology. And then also, if you can't have LASIK and you don't have cataracts yet, what are your options available in terms of technology? If you, if you have enough space inside your eye and we don't want to touch your human lens, we can consider implantable contact lens technology. And that comes in a range that is broader than what we're able to treat with laser vision correction anyway. So we can treat beyond a plus six. We can treat plus 10, plus 12. We can treat minus 20 um, Mm. and we can treat astigmatism that that we can customize up to minus nine minus ten we we order these lenses from the company they customize it to your eye so those lenses come through to our clinic with your name on the box Um, and we can implant that inside your eye it vaults over your normal lens so it lies above it doesn't touch it we haven't touched your own human lens Uh, so we're not affecting and that optical system and the ability it still has to to change shape somewhat to allow you to focus from near. So those are, are really, really great options uh, in cases where we cannot consider a, 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 um, either a LASIK surgery or uh, a lens removal for whatever reason. And and people don't know about these options. So they think, well, if I'm not a good LASIK candidate or I haven't got a cataract yet and I'm 38 and I'm a minus 8 or minus 12, uh, then I'm stuck. Then there's nothing I can do. And that's not the case. Uh, you know, 96% of the time, we'll be able to find a solution that uh, that suits you. And then one final question for today's Medical Monday, Dr. Joseph. Any other technologies that we haven't heard of yet? Yeah, sure. That, that, this field is expanding so rapidly. Um, when I was in Dublin doing my refractive fellowship, uh, we were the first clinic in Europe, or one of the first clinics in Europe, to use a lens technology which, when exposed to ultraviolet, so it's been implanted inside uh, the eye already, and and we expose it then to ultraviolet, which uh, basically excites the macromas in the that are in the substance of the lens. It's a silicone lens that changes the refraction. So we can then fine tune your refraction afterwards um, just by exposing that lens in a certain pattern with ultraviolet light. Uh, over three or four sessions and then we lock that in and that becomes your final vision so you, you, we can show you visual scenarios after surgery to say well this could be your distance this could be if we target you for near what would you like <laughs> so it, it, it really does 
help us broaden the patient's range of vision or their options after the surgery has been done. So many people think that, well, you know, once the surgery has been done, this is finite, that's it. And even in, in, in current lens conditions, it's not because we always offer our patients an enhancement or a laser touch-up after cataract or lens-based surgery if they're not quite on target or if they're not quite satisfied with the visual range that we've um, targeted you for. And uh, so that that is exciting stuff. It, it mm. is a bit time-consuming, unfortunately, you know, from the patient's perspective and the doctor's perspective. Um, we've also got lens technology where you can replace the central piece called the optic of the lens. So in uh, 10 or 20, 30 years' time, you come back and there's new lens technology available. We don't have to go and remove that whole lens from the eye, which can be tricky surgery. We literally just unclip the central optic, the central piece of the lens, and replace it with the new uh, the new technology. They are, are making lenses which are still not commercially available with a uh, we've already got ultraviolet um, uh, and you know filters built into these lenses, but ones that are photochromic, so they can tint when you go outside. So you've got mm. your own pair of cool sunshades built into the eye. Wow. Um, yeah, and then and then nanotechnology lenses where it works on electrostimulation and electronic signals, and basically um, it stimulates the muscle of the eyes to actually then change the shape of this of this lens um, just by electronic stimulation. Uh, so it helps you focus for near or for distance. But these are still in the pipeline, and uh, and many more to come. I mean, the the technologies are evolving mm. all the time. But having said that, I think what we've got available today is absolute world class. And um, if we choose the right lens for the patient, for their visual needs, you will be happy. That's the point. That's it. Wow. Well, very exciting developments indeed. Uh, Got to love technology, hey? Uh, Dr. Absolutely. Joseph, lastly, your contact details. How do we get in touch with yeah. you? So we're uh, in Neisner at, um, at uh, 4 Barracuda Street. We're uh, just adjacent to the Advanced Hospital or Advanced Day Clinic where we do all our lens-based surgery procedures. Um, so you can give Mariska a call on 044 150 uh, or you can email her at info at drdrdillonjoseph.com. And we've also got a Facebook page and uh, an Instagram page and a YouTube channel where you can actually listen to all of these podcasts and a number of talks on the various lens technologies and which lens may suit your visual lifestyle. So go and check out our YouTube channel after listening to this and you can certainly learn a bit more about the, uh, the lens choices. Always nice. Uh, Medical Monday really teaches us a lot. Dr. Joseph, thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, day and uh, week. Thank you very much. You too, Jan. Yeah.